let me introduce to you John 14 in a moment. Let's just flash down to verse 12. This is our truly, truly, I say to you. Remember, there are seven of these at the Last Supper. These are Messianic doctrines relevant to the Jewish age with the, with the coming of Christ and for the church age as pertinent doctrines. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. He talks about works, divine production. He talks about works. It's all based on, on believe. Notice that. It's based on two things in verse 12. The word believe, he who believes in me, the works I do, he shall do, and greater works than these shall he do. And then, and then he tells you how this, how this is going to work in biblical history. Now watch how it's going to work. Because I go to the Father. Right? Because I go to the Father. He gives you two parts of this is really important. Believing in Christ will result in divine production. You will, you will do the work of God on earth, but he's got to go first. When he goes back to the Father, then greater works will occur on the earth. So this is quite an enormous <coughs> passage and after a word of, word of prayer, we're going to take a good look at this. <clears throat> Let us pray. <coughs> I give you a moment of silence as a belief priest, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege to allow the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. A spiritual book, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It's just that simple. <clears throat> it's, not a compl it's not complicated. And... We should all desire, having been born again, our whole purpose on earth now is involved in spiritual living. The book, therefore, is, it can't be studied in carnality as a believer. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. Your responsibility is to confess them in silence through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's the, you look at those three categories, at least, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If you're aware of any, then you confess them in silence. Because he says, if you confess, then God will forgive and cleanse. And that allows the Holy Spirit to be the great teacher in this hour of study. So I give you that moment, both for those who are here in the congregation as well as those who are visiting with us by the Internet. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for the work of Christ. We, we celebrate the month of December <clears throat> as uh, the celebration time of the birth of Christ. We know he wasn't born in December, but we do celebrate it. And it's pretty much a whole month of celebration. <clears throat> and that's a good thing. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God as we look at the teaching uh, of, truly, truly, I say to you, this wonderful messianic doctrine that's attached to the Jewish age for the church age. Jesus has come to fulfill the law, the messianic law. He's come to fulfill it, to bring it into a fulfillment status, and we'll be benefited by it. He says to us, as soon as I go to the Father, then the followers of Christ will begin to do greater works than what he did. Now, we're not dealing with the cross. We're dealing with the divine production, not necessarily the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf as he hung there for our sins, but rather the results of that to those who believe in me to those who believe in the work of Christ, to those who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, greater works will come to them. 
And so we, we, we are thankful to be part of that group of people today. And I pray we would understand what that means in our life. Where, where are the works? Where's the divine production in our relationship to Christ? Make that clear to us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> What's interesting about chapter 14 is that the entire chapter 14 deals with uh, three disciples. The whole chapter deals with three disciples and Jesus responding uh, to some of their questions and some of their statements. So I want to break that down to show it to you because you're probably not aware of that unless, but now you will be, and so it, it will be important to you in the future. Notice on your paper, there's a discussion with Thomas. There's a discussion with Philip and a discussion with Judas, not, not Judas's carrot. Notice that. Now, when you, this week when you go back and you read chapter 14, you will find this laid out. So I'm going to lay it down for you to read. For example, the discussion that he has with Thomas is verses 1 through 7. It is in this conversation with Thomas that a very famous scriptural, a very famous scripture comes out that people quote all the time, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Very famous, right? That comes out of this discussion with Thomas. When we get to Philip, where, where we're interested in, it's a pretty heavy discussion with Philip. I'm only going to look at half of that discussion. I'm only looking at John 14, 8 through 14, the first half of that discussion. That discussion goes on in verses 15 through 21, and that's very important. One of the key ideas that come from the Philip section is this statement, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That is a theme of his discussion, just like I am the way, the truth, and life was kind of a theme with Thomas. The theme, the theme of discussion with Philip, if, you, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because you're going to see Philip ask the question, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And he was, well, it hasn't been up to now. <laughs> it hasn't been enough up to now. So what's going to change? I've been with you three, three and a half years. What's going to change? I've been with you three and a half years, and you haven't seen it yet. So what do you think is going to change in the next few hours? But it is a great discussion, and the theme of that discussion with him and when you read that in its total, you will, you'll begin to see it. And then, of course, the discussion with Judas, not Iscariot, is in verses 22 through 31. And the theme of that is really interesting. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to tease you into study, ain't I? I'm trying to tease you, right, that you'll go back and say, well, that's interesting. I'm going to look at the whole chapter, say, and if somewhere during this next week you stop and read the chapter and take a look at that, then this has been good, a good thing for me. All right. He, now, here's what this one is. And listen to this because we live this out in our life. Listen to what the, the theme of the discussion with Judas, not his care. Have I told you before it happens? I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, watch this now, you may believe. Doesn't that sound like parenting? <laughs> I mean, how many times have we said that? I mean, is that not parenting? I mean, that's, I mean, is that not down to basic level of discussion with, a, with a, somebody under your authority? Usually, we don't do the most important, important part of that. Usually, we say, watch it. Here's how, here's how most of us operate. I have, 
I, I, I have told you before it happens so that when it happens, right, and then we make up our own tale. You know what he said? That the scriptures may become alive in you. That's what he said. I'm going to tell you this ahead of time. So when it happens, it's going to happen. The snowball is going to roll down the hill. When it happens, you'll believe the scriptures. You'll believe the word of God. Because you'll believe something. And so, you see, I, I think that's really good ministry. I think that's good training at whatever level of authority you're in, whether you're a school teacher or a pastor or a parent or whatever. And so that's kind of the theme of the discussion with Judas, and it's well worth your time to look at, well worth your time. Our discussion today comes from the Philip section. It comes from the Philip section. And the theme of the Philip section, you remember I said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. That's the theme of it. Because it started with a question that Philip asked in verse 8. Actually, a demand, show us the Father. That's an aorist imperative. Show us, that's a command, uh, which is not a command, it's a demand. Uh, when you're talking to J show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And the word show is interesting because it means to exhibit, to put it on display. You know, that's what exhibit is, to put it on display. But he's, he's been on display for three and a half years. They still ask that. And so what's very interesting about this, this conversation, which remember the first half of the conversation he gives them a doctrine, and the second half, he tells them the application of it. But I'm only going to get the first half today because I'm of time restraint. So I can only do the first half. You'll have to do the second. But I have broken it down into two so that you might see it. What is the theme of this section with, with Philip is the inseparable relationship that Jesus has with God and that you have with God and Jesus inseparable relationship. And that's really important for you to understand. Inseparable relationship. Okay? Philip says to him, and this is how this whole discussion opened up. Philip said, I put it on your paper, Lord show. This, this word in the Greek language that I wrote there for you to see is in the aorist imperative. That's a hut to command. That's a command in the Greek language, an imperative. And this Greek word means to exhibit, to put it on display. Put it on display. And he says, show us. And who is he speaking on behalf of? See the us? He's speaking on behalf of somebody, isn't he? Oh, come on now. Is he not speaking on behalf of somebody? Yes. Of course he is. He's not speaking... On his own person, is he? Because he said, he would have said, show me. So he's speaking on behalf of the disciples. In other words, he's saying, listen, we all have this. We've been talking among ourselves. Okay, I want you to understand that. And listen, he uses it twice. Because it shows what they've been talking about that they're not getting. Show us, show us the show us the Father, and it is enough, Archeo. It is sufficient. Listen to me. If you get nothing else today, get this. Right? And and I know you'll get more, but this is a doggy bag thing. It's never enough when you walk by sight. Only when you walk by faith. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't write that down. 
That amazes me. You know why that amazes me? Because like a school teacher, when you know in your heart that you're going to put that on the final, and you stand up there, and it's going to be like 35 points, a third of your grade is going to come from the correct answer to this, and you sta stand up there and repeat that and tell them, other than saying, it's going to be on the test. That's the way I feel sometimes up here. Because you see, it's the word show, not tell. Show me. He's been three and a half years. He's raised people from the dead. He's healed people with blindness that could not see from birth. He's done miraculous. He's healed people with blood diseases that were headed to the funeral home. He's raised people from the dead who just left the funeral home. And you say to him, show us the Father. <laughs> when you walk by sight, and not by faith, sight is never enough. If you will show me the Father, it will be enough for us. It is never enough. It is never enough. It is never enough. And they're a classic example of that principle. You walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You walk by faith, not by sight. Your, your sufficiency Paul said it in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 9. Grace is sufficient. Grace always works from faith, never from sight. If you keep walking by sight, you're a cooked goose before Christmas. You're a cooked goose. Because it is never enough. That's the point. Jesus is going to make this point. I want to be sure you get that. Look at 1 Corinthians. Here's a verse people quote all the time. For that, and it's relevant to us. 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 13. You know this one. I'm just trying to bring it into relevance to your life that you don't walk by sight, you walk by faith, show us, show us, and it will be enough. It is never enough. Not for the believer. No temptation or testing has overtaken you You know what that means? Stop for a moment and think in your mind what does it mean to be overtaken? Let's suppose you're a runner. And you're in this great race. And you're, you're in the lead position. And you can see the goal of winning the race. It's right down there. It's... It's 50 feet, it's 40 feet, it's 30 feet. And you think you have it, you look to this side, and you look to that side. I ran in high school. You better never look back. Long distance guys did. But those of us who ran the 100, you never looked back. First of all, you didn't have enough time to look back. You never looked back. You looked on each side. If the coach ever saw you look back, you, 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 were done, you were done running for him. The time you lose, even the time to spend any much time looking either side of you, the coach used to say, don't even look except at the goal. It doesn't matter if somebody can catch you and pass you. It doesn't matter whether you see him or not, <laughs> you know? overtake you. No, listen to me. 
No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are capable of. This is a spiritual race, and your capacity comes from the Word of God functioning in your soul. It comes by you fighting the good fight of faith or running the course of faith, right? You know, I have, I have fought the... I have fought the fight. I have run the course. I have kept the what? Faith. You got to have capacity. You got to have the capacity and the capacity to run, to run the race comes from the word of God because it's a run of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, hearing in the sense that I understand it and I believe it. That That's... Listen, there's no way you can get through life without temptation, without trials and testing. It is because the very fact that you do have faith is why you get tested. And never beyond what you're capable of, but up to what you're capable of. Do you understand that? Is there anybody here today? I hope there are people on the internet paying attention. I hope they're paying attention. Let me talk about three things. Let me talk about three things in the time I have. It is interesting to me, at least, that Jesus responded to Philip's request with three questions. Now, Philip didn't ask him a question. He made a, he made a bold statement. I mean, a very bold he said, show me and put in the aorist imperative. That's a very bold statement. We call that a hut to command. But he doesn't, he's not commanding Jesus to do it. He's demanding it. Do you understand? Because he tells you what will be sufficient for him. And if I don't get it, I don't know what we're going to do. If I don't get this, he's demanding because if I don't get that, we're hung out to dry. Do you understand that? Okay. So he's, that's the kind of aorist imperative we have here. And so, but what's interesting to me is that how Jesus responded to him. He asked him three questions. He asked two questions and gave the answer. <laughs> oh, wait. You talk, and listen, he, you know why he's given, because he wants everybody to pass. Not because the teacher can look good. So that the two students can understand the importance of the subject in the application to their life. Isn't that why, isn't that why you teach like crazy? I know, I know, I know Terry does. I know that's what her goal in life is. She climbs out of bed every day and drags herself into a, a group of kids that five of them want to learn and the rest of them don't care. And she pounds it out and pounds it out and pounds it out. Why? Because she wants to pull a paycheck? That's why she puts up with the school system, not why she puts up with the kids. She pulls herself in every day, just like most of you that taught. Many of you have retired and taught all these years. You go, you go back to the same thing. You pull your paycheck from somebody that doesn't really give a hoot about you. But you give a hoot about it because you love these kids. And every once in a while, you find a few kids in there that just get it. Get it. Brings it into application in their life. And so here we are with this. And so look at verse 9. I'm in 14. Well, I'll get, get back to 14. John 14, 9. You know, in 8, he asks, he, he makes this bold, this bold demand, this bold statement. In the 14th chapter, verse 8, Philip makes this bold. Uh, then Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, it, and it, it will be enough for us. Listen, listen, watch this now. Look at verse 9. He's going to give a question. He's going to give an answer, and then he's going to give a question to see if they got the answer. He's going to give it. He's got... He's going to ask a question, give them the answer, and then ask a question to see if they got the answer. See, I do it all the time with you. I don't know if you realize it or not. I do it all the time with you, but that's all right. It don't matter. 
Have I been so long with you? Say, how? I mean, he's been three and a half years with him, showing him miracle after miracle after miracle that could only be done by God himself in the life of Christ. If God wasn't living in Jesus, he could not have done any of the miracles he did because they were outside of the boundaries of everything, outside the boundaries of common sense, outside the boundaries of miracles, outside the boundaries of creation. Any kind of law you can imagine, the miracles that Jesus did blew them right out of the water. Have I been with you so long and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? What's the answer? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Question. How do you say, show us the Father? You think they're not going to get that back on the test? Come on now, I just read to you 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Are they not going to get that back on that test? Oh, you can bet before this day is over. They're going to say, what? Did you write down what he said? I remember he, he, he hit this very thing. Do you remember? Did you write it down? Where did... See the answer? He who has seen me has seen the Father. You, you, know what, you know what the writer of Hebrews said in the first chapter, verse 3? He said that Jesus was the exact representation of God himself. How do you like the word exact? <laughs> I mean, he didn't say close, near, Almost. <laughs> if you've seen me, you've seen the exact representation of God himself. But unfortunately, boys, up to now, that hasn't been enough. Because you haven't seen any of it with the eyes of faith. You have not seen and learned this by the eyes of your soul. That's why many of you just don't get it. You just don't get it. You go to church, go to church, go to church. You're like the person who carries his lunch pail and never eats. You nibble on it, bring it home, and then mother's going to ask you why you didn't eat it, so you feed it to the birds on the way home because you don't want to have to go through a whole discussion on why you didn't eat it. That's, by the way, that's called pastoring. That's called pastoring. Look at that. He asked, him two que he asked a question, gave the answer, and asked the question to see if they got it. We know by the end of the book, they didn't get it. Just like some of you, you will not get it. It don't matter how many times I tell you. No matter how many times I tell you, that's really important. You ought to put it down because this, this is going to come back on your life as a test. Oh, you can cite the essence box of God. But where is it in the reality of your life? How is it possible that you believe as God, God is omnipotent and as soon as something don't fit in your little life, you fall apart? You just fall apart. The whole thing comes unglued. Then look what he does. He gives a third question, but it goes from 10 to 12. He's asked, now look, they, they, they demanded to, to, for him to show him. Show us. Show us. And show us the Father. Show us the Father. And it will be enough for us. Now he comes to a third question. Look at verse 10. 
do you not believe? And he introduces us. See, here's the breakdown. The breakdown is not that they didn't, it wasn't they didn't go to class. The breakdown wasn't that they didn't go to class. The breakdown is that when they went to class, it didn't break down in what they heard. It broke down in what they believed. They went, they went to class. They heard the message and didn't believe. How is that possible? They had the be- Listen, they had the best teacher in the whole wide world. See, you only got the second best. Just put it in the offering. Put that amen in the offering. <coughs> Look at that. Now, watch. Watch what he says. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now he's going to give the answer. He's going to give the answer to the test. <laughs> Don't you love this teacher? Is this not the teacher you want to be with? He wants to be sure. I want to teach you so well that you get an A all the time. And you can transfer how I am teaching you over to the 8th grade or the ninth grade or the 10th grade and get the A's there too. I'm going to teach you how to study. I'm going to teach you how to apply that study to your life. Look at, look at what he says. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. But the Father who is living in me, abiding in me, does his work. Look how it works. The word to the will to the work. You study the word of God to know the will of God to do the work of God. That's just how it works. And listen, it doesn't work any other way. You can't put work before word. It goes from the work. It goes from the word to the will to the work. And And he shows you the principle. Do you believe? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father who abides living dynamically in me does his work. See, they wanted to say, see, the word was show me, exhibit. He says, again, believe me, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is me. We call that positional truth. Otherwise, believe. Otherwise, believe on account of the works themselves. I guarantee it. These guys who travel with Jesus three and a half years and saw him do all these miracles didn't write them down. Oh, they remember some of the spectacular ones. Oh, I remember that lady had that blood disease for 38 years, come up and upset everybody, grabbed a hold of his hem and did all that stuff. Oh, I remember that one. No, I don't remember. Yeah, no, I don't. How many did he do? I don't know. He did a lot, though. Show me the Father. Show me the Father. Manifest the Father, and it would be enough. I've been doing it. I've been doing it for three and a half years, and it hasn't been enough. You know why? Because you don't, you don't walk by faith. You walk by sight. And Christians, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be a cooked goose if you do that. You're a cooked goose. You can go to church. You can study the Bible. You can open the Scriptures, and you can look at them. But if you don't believe them, it's not going to carry you down the road. You're not going to pass the test. The test is coming because the message was spoken When the message is spoken, the test is coming. Whether you're prepared or not is up to you. I'm just telling you. I am just telling you. It's the way it is. And so he says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father. Otherwise, believe on the account of the works themselves, miracles. Truly, truly. Here it is, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes. Do you see that? That's the fourth time he's used this word. Believe in me 
the works that I shall do, he shall, he shall, not, not him, but the person who believes. The person who believes in Christ, the works that I do, he shall, the believer shall do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father, and I leave you with the work. And the work will not get done if you don't believe in me. And if you don't believe in the words I speak to you. Because these are the words of life in the kingdom. You can see that the disciples' failures was the failure of not walking by faith. They sat in class. They heard the message and did not cycle it to a place of faith. If, it, if what you hear does not go to the place of faith, it will never go into your life. It goes in one ear and out the other. It should go in one ear and out your life. It shouldn't go in one ear and out the other. It should go in one ear and out your life. The word believe is interesting when you look at verse 9 and 10's use of a positional truth about divine union and the word of God. Do you know that the word for word is rima? It's not logos. It's remas. It means categorical thinking. It means the word of God taught to your life in a pertinent way that has pertinent information. This is math class. This is English class. This is history class. This is P.E. The words, the words I speak are not my own. The works I do are not my own. How about that? And then he comes into this idea of works with air gun. And he, and he transferred that whole system. Listen, that whole system. Listen to me now. You're missing this. The whole system that he has been living under himself for three and a half years of ministry, he's now transposing it to them. Did you miss that? How, how, how is it possible? Look at verse 12. That's our, that's our big verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, he who, he who, say he who. That's who you are. You're a he who. Well, you're a he who, right? Maybe. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I shall do, he do also, shall he do also, because, and greater works shall he do, right? Because I go to the Father. And look, I wrote some dynamics in the Greek language. For example, he who believes me is a present imper a, a participle. The works that I do, that's a present active indicative out of the life of Christ. Then he says he will do in the future, greater works will he do in the future. See that F is future, future tense. Future of what? Now listen to me. That's two future tenses that, 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 that's connected with he who's. Are we he who's? We're he who's. I know. It, I know it sounds a little strange, but that's who we are. And look, 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 look. It's a future tense to what? Here's the test. A future tense to what? Because I go to the Father. After I ascend from the earth and seat at right hand of God the Father, this is going to be you, he who. It's going to be run by the he who's. The whole divine program is going to be run by the he who's. I know this is the only thing you'll remember from my sermon today. The he who's. Look at verse 13 and 14. In verses 13 and 14, he tells them how to, that out of this system is going to come a great prayer life. One of, the great, one of the works and one of the greater works in your life will be your prayer life. Let me ask you, gentlemen. You're believers. You're he who's, right? You're believers. Let me ask you. 
You prayed with your wife? You prayed with your wife? You prayed with your children? How is this possible? How is this possible? Oh, I know you're the authority. You carry, you, you wear the britches, right? Okay. You got the checkbook. Yeah. You, you're the man. You're the man. Then step up the plate and be a man. Step up the plate and be a man. You say, well, my wife really don't. You ask your kids whether they want to do something or not. Huh? Well, if you don't want to make your bed today, be all right. You don't want to put your clothes, that's all right. Produce a slug. We'll have to send him to the army to teach him how to make a bed. Hut two. Should, shouldn't have to do that. How was it possible? You don't pray with your mate. How is it possible? How is it possible that men don't lead that? Oh, you lead everything else. You're great for a family discussion. I, don't, I bet you lead when it comes to sex in the evening. How come you don't lead spiritually? Listen to what he says about prayer. See, he's talking about works and greater works. See, prayer is part of that works and greater works. Listen to what he says. And whatever you ask in my name. See, he's, he's dealt with believing, has he? Believe, 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 right? That's been the theme. And, and do you know what's interesting? This is the way the chapter opened. Look at verse 1. This, this is how the chapter opened. Look at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. How about that? The whole chapter is just eaten up with this idea. Believe, 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 believe. You know what you're... He said, he's handpicked these disciples. They've been three and a half years going to seminary. And they still haven't got it. Some point, we got to get this stuff. It's now, you're never going to get it until you start believing it and understanding it so that you can apply it. Here's prayer life. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father, see, the whole idea was show us the Father and it'd be enough. Show us, demonstrate the Father. I need to feel him, sense him, touch him. I got the, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, then, whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. How does that happen? The Son answers the prayer. You ask, it, you ask that prayer in my name, I will answer that prayer, and you, listen, the answer to that prayer will, will show you the glory of God. <laughs> Did you ever think about prayer having that much influence and impact upon your life? You, want, you say, show me the Father, show me the Father, show me the Father. Well, then try praying. I'll show you the Father. I'll show you answered prayer that glorifies God. Wow. If you ask anything in my name, see, he's always answering. He, he's always telling you the exact thing you need to know. He's giving you the answers to the test. He's still doing it. Holy catfish, and you're not getting it. That's so disturbing. But I can't do anything about it. it. Listen, he started with whatever you ask in my name. Now he says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now we know it has to be ask according to his will. But in this case, with his disciples, show me. See, the idea is to demonstrate to me uh, the, the God as my father. Show me God as my father, and it'll be enough. He said, okay, let me go through this. Let me go through it, and now let me show you. It's going to be works and greater works. So let me tell you something. And listen, here's what they know that you don't. When they walked with him, what they asked, he gave. If it, if, it, if it was in any way compatible with the will of God, he did it. 
He says to them, listen, guys, I want you to feed the multitude that's come today. They looked at the bank account and said, there's no way we can do it. He said, well, I still, I'm still requesting it. <laughs> well, they go, well, it must be something beyond the checkbook because the checkbook ain't, can't work. Okay, put the checkbook up, Judas. I still want the people fed. So they find this little boy with a sack lunch. And history's made in the church. History's made. And the lesson's lost. Show us the Father and it'll be sufficient. Show us the Father. And so what's he do? He takes his sack lunch. He lays it on the table. And he prays his prayer to God Almighty. He prays his prayer to God Almighty on behalf of these disciples who have asked him. And it's done. Now they have the gall to say, show us the Father. And it would be enough. <laughs> well, I got point one. And apparently it was enough. Point one, you, it, it, would do, it would serve you well because in point three, I go into a detailed understanding of what it means to do the work and then to do greater works 